So I would like to take you on a small journey, if I may, to a place like this. Uh, I want to bring a big idea to you, which I find rather fascinating. Uh, it's a quotation. I'll tell you where it comes from at the end of the gig. Uh, but it is this. Things have been much better since the universe was here. And I want to explore this idea in company with a few luminaries. We will meet, for example, Galileo. We will meet Isaac Newton. We will meet Albert Einstein. Well, he will in a minute. <laughs> there he goes. And we will meet, of course, Her Majesty the Queen, uh, as well as a gentleman called Professor Sir Roger Penrose, who, when he gave a public talk at this university a few years ago, be became the first person I've ever seen uh, take a mobile phone call in the middle of his public lecture. <laughs> so I do it all the time now. If he can do it, I'm sure I can. So the point about this quotation is that it's really uh, rather unusual. In fact, in some sense, it doesn't make sense. Because the universe, of course, uh, encompasses everything that we can ever know or detect. So how can we know what things were like before there was a universe? And in fact, because time might have started at the beginning, was there even a before? So I'd like to explore this over the next few minutes. Um, in, in well, the normal fashion that I employ is to give a trilogy in four parts, but I think this one's got five. Uh, and we'll start with some ideas of space and time that you're probably all, all aware of, but you're going to get them anyway. You all know when we look up on a starry night, that's what you see. You see stars. Uh, not quite as many as that. That's indeed a Hubble Space Telescope image of the central region of our galaxy. But I'm sure you also know as well that when we look out into space, we're always looking back in time, and that's because of the finite speed of light. Light travels at a speed of 30 centimeters per nanosecond. That means it travels what we used to call a foot in one billionth of a second. And that's quite interesting because, for example, it means that you people down here at the front, I'm seeing you as you were about 15 billionths of a second ago. Whereas you people up at the back, I'm seeing as you were about 60 billionths of a second ago. And it's true, actually, you do look a bit younger, you people <laughs> up at the back, than the ones down here at the front. Of course, when you look at me, you're looking straight back to the 1960s, but that's something else completely different. So all this means that when we in the world of astronomy use our big telescopes, and this is the one I use at the uh, Australian Astronomical Observatory in Coonabarra, and it's called the Anglo-Australian Telescope, we're actually using them as time machines. We're using them to look back in time and, and essentially uh, explore the history of the universe. So very briefly, when we see objects in our own solar system, we're always looking back by a few minutes. When we see things in our own galaxy, like gas clouds, such as this one, the, the Orion Nebula, we're looking back a few thousand years. But when we start seeing other galaxies beyond our own, we're looking back millions, hundreds of millions, and sometimes billions of years. In fact, in our telescope, it's commonly billions. And so as you look further out in space, you expect to see things looking younger, which we do. But at some point, we expect to see the very first stars forming. Now, we haven't seen that yet. But we know that before that, there was a period that astronomers call the Dark Ages, when nothing was shining. And before that, was the event in which the universe was created, a thing called the Big Bang. It took place about 13.7 billion years ago, probably um, on April the 1st. I've always thought that there was something funny about the universe. But the, the reason why astronomers are so hooked on the idea of a hot Big Bang uh, as the origin of the universe is that we can still see it. We see something called the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the flash of the Big Bang. It's over the entire sky. That's it there. That's one of the latest maps of it. We're going to get a shiny new one next year from a spacecraft called Planck not named after a piece of wood, after a person. Um, those little ripples you can see in that map are actually caused, they were caused by sound waves when the universe was still glowing brightly. It's the bang of the Big Bang. And it turns out that they're quite important. Now, astronomers being fixated with all these things want to explore ever further in space. One of the things we want to do is to see the first stars. So you need big telescopes. We live in an era at the moment 
called the era of VLTs. VLTs are very large telescopes. Um, but we're on the brink of uh, a new era of so-called ELTs, of which this is one. ELT is an extremely large telescope. This one has the wonderful name of the TMT, the 30-meter telescope, because it has a mirror 30 meters across. It doesn't exist yet, but they've got some rather nice computer-generated image images of it. The Europeans were going to build one a few years ago called OWL, the overwhelmingly large telescope. <laughs> but but they've actually cut it back because they can't be overwhelmed anymore. My own personal belief is that in about 50 years, there will be a telescope called the FBT. <laughs> the FBT will be the phenomenally big telescope <laughs> because nobody will be able to spell uh, in 2062. All right, that's all about telescopes. Let me have an aside here, since I've got 11 minutes and 52 seconds left. An aside about time travel. You might be surprised to know that time travel is actually possible under the laws of relativity. The problem is you can only go one way. So it's a one-way trip. How do you do it? Well, you make use of Einstein's theory of relativity, which says that as you get nearer the speed of light, your clocks run slower. It's called time dilation. And you can use that uh, in a little recipe to visit, for example, our own planet in a 1,000 years. Let's say we want to get to the Earth in uh, 3012. Uh, what do you do? Well, first of all, you get a spacecraft. They don't exist yet quite like this, but never mind, there's one there that's good enough. Um, and you head to a nearby star, well, nearby in cosmo cosmological terms. For example, Betelgeuse, the star at the shoulder of Orion, or if you're in Australia, underneath the saucepan, uh, which is about 500 light years away. The trick is you've got to travel there at nearly the speed of light. And then when you get there, you take all your holiday snaps and everything, you turn around and you come back. And the outcome is that in that time, during that journey, the Earth is a thousand years older, but you've only aged ten years. You're ten years older, but the Earth is a thousand years older. It's dead easy. All you need is a spacecraft. We haven't quite got it yet. Um, it does beg the question, of course, what will the Earth be like in 3012? Well, we all know because we saw it in the movies. It looks like this. <laughs> And there will, of course, be some things that simply uh, will not change. Uh, this is one of them. There you are, Your Majesty. I hope you're still going in 3012. I certainly won't be. So let me now get to part uh, 73 of this three-part talk, uh, which is about gravity. Because it turns out that when you're trying to think about the universe as a whole, Gravity is a very important aspect of it. And our history of gravity is quite interesting. It goes back a long time. In the beginning, uh, the first person to think about it was a man called Aristotle, who lived quite a long time ago. He looked uh, sort of like this. This is his bust in the Louvre in France. And I always thought he looked a bit weird there about the eyes, so I gave him some eyes. <laughs> and he actually looks quite a lot better. Um, these ancient Greeks were, of course, very polite. They always, you know, they were always grateful. So Aristotle thought not too hard about gravity. But then there was the man I mentioned at the beginning. Here's Galileo trying to flog a telescope to three chicks he met in the forum who were not at all <laughs> impressed with the idea. Um, we all know that he dropped things off the Leaning Tower of Pisa and worked out that gravity actually pulls things downwards at the same time acceleration, no matter what sort of object it is you're throwing off the edge of the, uh, of the leaning tower. And then there was perhaps the greatest name in, in gravity, uh, in the, certainly in the 17th century, uh, Isaac Newton, who you can see here on a bad hair day. Um, Newton, no, it's a bad hair day, whichever way you look at it, it really doesn't make any difference, it's still a bad hair day. Uh, Newton did some extraordinary work in uh, the 1660s, which I don't have time to tell you about, on optics. But his great work was published in 1687, his masterpiece, a book with the catchy title of Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica. Uh, you've probably read it yourself. Uh, the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. And it gave his ideas on motion and gravitation. I haven't time to tell you all the details, but it basically linked the phenomena that we see in the sky with gravitation that pulls things down onto the ground. And it became 
the law of the universe for the next 200 years. And it all came apparently from an apple falling on his head. Uh, all that was really turned over uh, by our modern view uh, because that, of course, comes from this gentleman who wasn't actually that color. It was the only picture I could easily find that wasn't copyright. Uh, but Einstein, who said that gravity is not a force, it is a warping of space-time. It's actually space-time becoming bendy, and it's caused by the presence of matter. You might be surprised to hear that the shape of space and time uh, is different at this level than it is from this level, and that's why I feel uh, a pull down towards the Earth. So it's a warping. There's the warping. See, it looks like that. But this is actually what a cluster of galaxies does to space-time. If you imagine God holding a piece of graph paper up behind a cluster of galaxies, it gets mangled by the warping caused by the gravity of the cluster. Now, the, the real nub of this issue is that when you look at things on a very small scale, uh, namely the quantum scale, uh, which is where things are less than about 10 to the minus 33 of a centimeter across, just if you want a round number. Down in the quantum world, gravity is actually a headache. In fact, it's a pain in the neck because it doesn't seem to fit with all the other things. And let me show you why. We know that there are four basic forces in nature. Um, and they start with the strongest. It's called the strong nuclear force. And if you imagine that has a relative strength of one, uh, I'll tell you this is what binds the nuclei of atoms together, that has a relative strength of one, but the next strongest is the electromagnetic force, which makes light and radio waves and also uh, allows uh, um, atoms to stick together. That has a relative strength, actually it's one over 137, but it's about a hundredth of the strong nuclear force. The next one is called the weak nuclear force, and that's what makes chemical reactions occur. Its relative strength is about a hundredth again, one ten thousandth. And then comes along gravity. Gravity is a little bit weaker still. In fact, its relative strength is 100 billion, 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 billionth of the strong nuclear force. It is rather feeble. Uh, and even though we feel the force of gravity pulling us down quite strongly, it easily overcomes the resistance of the atoms to being torn apart, which is what would happen if, uh, if its relative strength was one. Why is gravity so weak? Well, one idea uh, is that it might be leaking out into other dimensions. In other words, the four dimensions of space and time that we can perceive here in our universe might be leaky, and perhaps gravity escapes out of our universe uh, into another one. This is not a picture of another universe. This is a thing called a uh, three-dimensional cross-section of a six-dimensional Calabi-Yau manifold. If you want to know more about that, don't ask me. Uh, I'd hate you to think uh, I know anything about what I'm talking about here. But other universes might well have a geometry like that. And um, that, of course, then begs the question that perhaps there is something called the multiverse, a multitude of universes, an idea that was proposed by several people, including Professor Sir Martin Rees, uh, formerly the Astronomer Royal in the UK. I love this cartoon, which is God complaining uh, about the universe that he's bought uh, because it's expanding. So um, there you go. Uh, universe salesmen all, all look like that. I've seen a few of them, I can tell you. Uh, but it leads to the possibility of multiple universes. So perhaps we can see the universe from the outside. There's multiple universes as championed by Roger Penrose, among others. Uh, there he is again, uh, feeling suitably gleeful. Uh, Roger Penrose thinks that in the detail of the cosmic microwave background radiation, the flash of the Big Bang seen uh, over this extraordinary distance in space and time, we might find evidence for universes that have come before ours. And in fact, when the results of the Planck spacecraft start being uh, released next year, he will be among the first looking for little circular signatures that might reveal that, yes, the universe did have a before. So back to the quotation, things have been much better since the universe was here. Did it come from a great physicist, a Roger Penrose, an Albert Einstein, or a Sir Martin Rees, or even Her Majesty the Queen? No, none of the above. Uh, this quotation comes from uh, a Spanish waiter whose name was Jose, uh, who uh, ran a restaurant at a place called Tazacorte uh, in La Palma. La Palma has an observatory on it. It's an island in the Canary Islands, and we were filming there to do a documentary uh, uh, in his restaurant eating fish, as you do when you're doing an astronomy documentary. Uh, somebody said to Jose, what do you think about the universe? And he said, ah, things have been much better since the universe was here. 
because he didn't really know the difference between the English words for universe and observatory. He kind of got them mixed up, but it, it's a beautiful, beautiful quotation, and one that has stayed with me ever since, as has this picture, because in all things, especially science, and especially, especially cosmology, uh, you should never take anything for granted, especially quotations from Spanish waiters. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Uh,